So, this is session number two of four this year, and it's about anti-Semitism. And the title is Global Anti-Semitism and Why Should Non-Jews Care? The assumption being that it's obvious why Jews would care about anti-Semitism because anti-Semitism is defined as the dislike of Jews. So if you're Jewish, you don't want to be disliked. Nobody wants to be disliked. Coincidentally, and I did not admittedly think about this when I uh, scheduled, when we scheduled this lecture series, tomorrow is International Holocaust Remembrance Day, a day that was uh, inaugurated at the United Nations in 2005 to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, which took place on January 27th, 1945. It was celebrated the United Nations relatively consistently for a few years, and then it took a pause. You know, we could talk a lot about the United Nations, and obviously it has been a flashpoint for anti-Semitism in 1975. There was actually a UN resolution that said Zionism is racism. But anti-Semitism has been around for several thousand years, for several thousand years, because, because there because Jews have been around for several thousand years. And that's really what it is. You know, I talked about this a little bit last time, and I shared some personal stories about my own background, being born in Israel, having spent a good chunk of my adult life and childhood in Israel. I spent most of my childhood and young adult life in Canada. And I wore a pin today that actually has all three flags on it, something Yay. we put together at APAC 20 years ago. I know that there's at Yay. least one non-Canadian here in the room, but are there? <laughs> Um, there are a few. All right, so I'll translate for you. But I didn't really grow up with any overt anti-Semitism. And today we're going to talk about overt anti-Semitism, covert anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism from the left, anti-Semitism from the right. I attended a Jewish day school in Montreal. And as I mentioned in the previous, I actually attended several Jewish day schools in Montreal, but you know, I'm not lying on a couch right now. Um, and then I transferred out. I actually went on a high school trip, uh, organized every year the ninth graders would go to Israel, and I went on that trip. And I was very disappointed in that trip because I did spend a chunk of my childhood in Israel. I spoke Hebrew, I was able to interact with the other Israelis that we were meeting, we're on kibbutz. We started kibbutz for three weeks. It was a long time to be on a kibbutz. We're actually on kibbutz Alumim, which is right near the Gaza border. Alumim and Saad, two, uh, we were divided on three kibbutzim. We were on Alumim. And I spent a lot of time with the Israelis, around with them. And the other Canadians on the trip didn't really want to spend that much time with the Israelis. They were sort of in their own little clique. <laughs> And then I left, and for those of you who are from Montreal, I went from Herzliya High School to West Hill High School, which is not a Jewish school, and within two weeks of being there, they painted a big swastika on the entrance of the school. And I wasn't really that alarmed. I think in retrospect, as a 15-year-old who had just left the, you know, the cocoon of the Jewish life and a Jewish education, maybe this was a sign, go back, turn around, you're not welcome anymore. But I didn't see it that way, and it was an isolated incident. Since then, unfortunately, there have been many more of these incidents. But it's like the Central Park jogger cage, you know, Trish Miley. I mean, I know her name, I, I, I know people went to school with her. But people know you don't run in Central Park at night. And yet, there's one person who was horribly assaulted, and not to, not to diminish the crime in any way, shape, or form, but we know who she is, we know what happened to her, she recovered, she worked on Wall Street, and she's now raising a family. Um, and similar with anti-Semitism, yes, it's happened, it's terrible, and it, it, and it needs to be called out, but it, it felt pretty isolated. I have spent most of my life feeling like I was exempt from Jewish history. And as a student of Jewish history, and, and we all know enough, but we can go back to anti-Semitism. I, I had lunch actually yesterday with Amir Baron, and, Michael Bentalila, who's the chief of police of Aventura, and said, you want to know what's going to happen in the Middle East? Read the Bible. It's, it's there, right? The tochacha, the, 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 the warnings of we'll be kicked out of the land, we'll be able to come back. And again, this is not a theology lesson, but, but a lot of those things happened. Uh, Jewish sovereignty is a very precious thing that tends to last for 
pretty short periods of time. If you combine the uh, reigns of King Saul, King David, King Solomon, you barely make a century. And then the, and then the kingdom was divided and first the northern tribes were expelled by the Assyrians and Seleucids really and they disappeared. And you know, about 130 years later, 140 years later, the, uh, the uh, southern tribes, Judah, were, were expelled, um, exiled by the Babylonians and returned 70 years later when the Persians defeated the Babylonians, but not to a sovereign Israel. And then the Chasmoneans had a sovereign Israel also for about 100 years in the, in the second and first centuries um, before the Common Era. And then, you know, the Romans came and we were exiled and we were dispersed. That's where diaspora comes from, dispersion. And we have lived most of our history as the other. And we weren't allowed to own land. And that's another reason why people were antagonistic because we couldn't work the land and therefore we had to either be tax collectors or money lenders or in the very best case professions that required some education like law or medicine and therefore the accusations were that Jews were um, in an entitled class and it was it was unwinnable for centuries for millennia and and it's it's we kind of think that's part of the DNA that's part of what we're going to have to contend with forever and I, I actually don't believe that's true and I, you know I'm going to make a comment and then come back to, the, to it towards the end of the lecture um, you know anti-semitism doesn't exist because of Israel Israel must exist because there's anti-Semitism. And if there's one takeaway that I'll leave you before Shabbat, that's it. I'll say it again towards the end. The history of the Jewish people is a very sad history, but it's also a very long history. There are many, 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 many people that had comparable histories, but for much shorter periods of time. And we don't know about them because their histories ended. Their histories ended 2,000 years ago, 1,800 years ago, where are the Amorites, where are the Edomites, where are the uh, Midianites, you know, where are the, the, the ancient Persians, right, they've been resuscitating around, that's not really them, the Macedonians, the Greeks, it's not really them, the Egyptians even aren't even really, you know, the, 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 the progeny of the ancient pharaohs that lived 36 uh, to 45 centuries ago. Today, the Jews are I mean, we may probably don't look a lot like we looked then, but we've cleaved to our religion, to our beliefs, to our peoplehood, and recognizing that wherever we were, we weren't going to get to stay very long. So we mentioned those two sort of biblical expulsions, but you had expulsions in Europe, you had expulsions in the Middle East. <laughs> Jews had a better time, actually, under Muslim rule than under Christian rule. I think looking around the room, we're all old enough to remember when the church still felt like a very antagonistic entity. You know, whether they didn't do enough in the Holocaust or in some cases they were complicit during the Holocaust, it just felt like they were an all-powerful religion that, that existed in order to use the Jews as scapegoats and as the others, as the otherness. I mean, in the Muslim world, Jews were dimmies, but so were Christians, so was anybody else who wasn't a Muslim. You have to wear a funny hat or a badge, that's where the Nazis took the yellow star, to, and you'd have to pay tribute. But for the most part, with some catastrophic you know, exceptions, Jews were allowed to live in Muslim lands. That wasn't the case in, in Europe at all. You know, the Jews were expelled and then brought back into Rome. Uh, the Jews were thrown out of cities all over Europe throughout the Middle Ages. They were blamed for the plague. They were blamed for all sorts of famines. They were, they were the scapegoat. Now, it wasn't only the Jews. When the Romans took over Egypt, they were, Egypt then had Greek immigrants too who came over and you know, Hellenized during the, again, the Seleucid Empire. The Greeks were persecuted, but the Greeks didn't take their anger out against the Romans who ruled over them. They took their anger out against the Jews because it was easier. And then they rallied the Romans and the local Egyptians to gang up on the Jews. And the Jews in, 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 in Egypt, I mean, this is not in every history book, but the Jewish population of Egypt, and this is probably over 100,000 people, were annihilated, exterminated in 115 CE. So this is not new. 
know, later some Jews trickled back into, the, into Egypt and they were already living in other parts of the Middle East. The first country to have a comprehensive expulsion of Jews was England, 1290, Edward I, they said Jews get out. It wasn't until Oliver Cromwell was prime minister in 1665 that they were, they were allowed back in. France, Austria, Hungary, Germany, everywhere. And then sometimes they were sort of, you know, quasi-expulsions, like when Catherine the Great in 1791 created a pale of settlement where there were, Jews were allowed to live, but only in a predefined area. You had four million Jews living in the pale of settlement up until the massive immigration, mostly in the United States, at the end of the 19th, early 20th century. So, and you had the Crusades, and you had the Cossacks, and you had the Inquisition. Some of these seemed spontaneous, some of these were driven by the sovereign. So clearly the Inquisition was directed by, by the, was the Catholic Church, but under the direction of the monarchy. The pogroms in, in, in Russia were clearly encouraged, if not catalyzed, by, you know, by the ruling class. And Jews were just expected to take it. And that's what bothers me so much about uh, ceasefire. For those of you who haven't been watching the news this morning, the International Court of Justice actually did deliver their preliminary opinion. And it's, um, it's, it's interesting because it's not different, so different than what I would have predicted because it's, it's not actionable. So it's not something, it wouldn't have been actionable anyway. I talked about this last week. It, the, the ICJ has no teeth. They can't enforce compliance with their, own, um, with their own proclamations. But it essentially said that it's not exactly genocide, but we're gonna monitor you really, really closely. It's almost like they're giving them a warning, like a yellow card in soccer. Um, so if you look at it, if you look at the world the way I look at the world, it's an abomination they even took this case, right? I mean, this would embarrass Kafka. But they did, and I, I feel, just as an aside, we'll come back to Canada for a second, I feel like human rights has just been turned upside down in the past 80 years. When I look at these international institutions that claim legitimacy and essentially bastardized justice, it pains me because you know, I studied law, I had some professors who are actually well known in, in, in the human rights field. Uh, we had the first human rights lawyer, Abraham, right? For those of you who want to say it's in the Bible, Abraham pleaded with God not to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He's negotiating with God. He's a human rights advocate for really bad people. But if you can find a few good ones, let's not destroy all of them. Um, and like even this week, we're reading, uh, you know, Bashalach, and, and, and the Israelites are gonna cross, cross the Red Sea. And, and the Jews have been nurtured by their faith in God. It has sustained us. You know, we talked about last week about the, 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 the failure of intelligence and, and um, confirmation bias. I mean, the first famous story of, they call them spies, they were really scouts, but when the leaders of the 12 tribes came back, and two, you know, Caleb from Yehuda, and, and Yoshua from Ephraim said, we can, we can beat those guys, and the other 10 said no, because they had, and people believed them because their confirmation bias was being slaves, right? They, they didn't feel like they were strong enough to beat these giants that are, that are Nephilim, that are, that are in, the, in the land of Canaan, and that's why they had to wait. They didn't all get killed. Some of them did because they then, you know, violated a, a divine order, but most of the people then living were allowed to live for the ensuing 40 years till their way of thinking disappeared in favor of a new emboldened way of thinking that had a better confirmation bias, not as slaves, but as people who witnessed miracles. And this is the biggest one in this week's part, the parting of the Red Sea. You, you know, you heard the expression between a rock and a hard place or between the Egyptian army and, and water. And you no, know, do not try this at home, but the seas parted and the Israelites walked through. And, and when I have conversations about what's going on in the Middle East and about anti-Semitism, about things that keep me up at, at, at night, and I have these conversations with religious, God-fearing people who are also intelligent and deep thinkers, ultimately it comes back to the concept that God will rescue us and, and maybe he will, she will. But for the time being, it's, it feels pretty scary. Anti-Semitism was a very big deal, and people were talking about it a lot. On, a, 
October up to October sixth, and there were there were problems on campus. There were problems in the cities. There were problems in the media, and what seemed pretty bad has now become catastrophic. And my advice to all of us is call it out, nip it in the bud. I lived in New York in the 1990s and there was something called the broken glass, broken window, broken glass is crystal enough, broken window theory. Broken window theory means that if, if, a, if, if a window is broken by vandalism, repair it. Because if you don't repair it, other people are gonna see, it's not repaired, I can break another window. And it doesn't matter if you're in a poor neighborhood or a wealthy neighborhood. If breaking windows becomes acceptable, there are gonna be a lot of broken windows. And Giuliani was the mayor at the time before he became sort of a caricature of himself. Um, but the real author of the strategy was Bill Bratton, who was a legendary commissioner of the police force. And he's the one, maybe some civil rights lawyers would argue overreached, but Every transgression was responded to, whether it was fair evasion on the subway, uh, drinking in public, vandalism. Uh, he just had this theory that if, if we let small things go, microaggressions become macroaggressions, and then the fabric of society is, is undermined and, and ultimately at risk of, of unwinding. And it worked. The crime rate in New York dropped precipitously. And I'm not saying that breaking a window then leads to murder or, 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 or other you know, much more serious criminal offenses, but this idea of signaling sends a very powerful message. And I feel that when I said I'm, you know, I felt exempt from Jewish history, I was very careful not to see anti-Semitism behind every tree or look for it under every rock. And, and I thought that there was an alarmist, sensationalist uh, rejection of sort of the, the, the new, slightly more forgiving acceptance of where we are in society and what we're able to accomplish. I didn't, I didn't think that anti-Semitism was benign, but sometimes I felt that when people, you know, were cut off in traffic, it's not because that other person's anti-Semite and anti-Semitic. If they didn't get a job they wanted, Certainly in, in Canada, the United States, I didn't feel, didn't feel they were anti-Semitic. Um, so my experience in high school, as I mentioned, was very enlightening because I actually now spend time with Greeks and Italians and blacks, and I play football and I play hockey. And you know, the, the most extreme example that I can think of was actually people telling me that I'm pretty cool for a Jew. I mean, <laughs> thank you. You're pretty cool for a Gentile. Um, and then I, I went off to, to grad school at, at, at the United States. I studied law at Harvard, and I came back and I clerked for the United States Supreme, for the Canadian Supreme Court. So that's prestigious. What surprised me when I got there was that I was the only Jew. There was another one whose father she was Jewish, but she didn't identify as a Jew. And I would have expected, based on maybe past years, and I didn't know what would happen in future years, but out of 27 law clerks, to be the only Jew I thought was pretty pretty remarkable. Um, and then two cases came to the court, and I'll translate this for the non-Canadians. Zundel and Keekstra were both heard by the Canadian Supreme Court the year that I clerked. So Ernst Zundel was a crank. He was a pamphleteer who was born in Germany, married some French Canadian, came to Canada, and just spewed out all sorts of drivel. And he would publish these pamphlets about denying the Holocaust, but he was just one of these conspiracy theory theorists that, you know, I don't, I, he just wanted to create chaos. It's like people who deny the Holocaust, it's not just about that, right? I mean, it's like the Holocaust never happened, and, and uh, if it did, it would be a good thing, and I hope it happens again, but it never did, right? So they're, they're crackpots. And he just kept doing this, and he was prosecuted under a provision of the Canadian uh, Criminal Code, 338. James Keekstra was a high school teacher and a mayor in a town called Eckville, Alberta. And his brand of anti-Semitism, in my view, was a little bit more insidious. He would actually not only teach his students that Jews are at the root of all evil, but he would grade their papers in a way that was demonstrably correlated to how faithful they were to the drivel that he spewed out in class. He was also the mayor of the town. 
And he was prosecuted under um, 212. So look, without getting into the interstices of Canadian constitutional law, the argument here obviously was that this was a violation of their freedom of expression. Canada had promulgated a charter of rights and freedoms about seven years earlier, and it had a notwithstanding clause, meaning that yes, it is a violation, but it's a defensible violation if it meets certain standards that are demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So they were both prosecuted without telling my personal story, and I had a, an interesting one. I could tell those of you who are interested, maybe after class or another time. I was amazed at the reaction of my co-clerks. It, it, it actually, there was, a, there was a vote that flipped it from, from plus one um, striking down the legislation to plus one in favor of upholding the legislation, and, and Keekstra's conviction was, was, was upheld. But I had people come up to me and say, I hope the fact that you're Jewish is not going to affect your thinking on, on this. <laughs> And all I could say, coming back to you're pretty cool for a Jew, is I hope the fact that you're not Jewish doesn't affect yours, right? I mean, and, and that had a profound impact on how I understood better, not differently, but a little bit better, on the differences between how anti-Semitism is expressed. And let's fast forward to where we are right now. We have anti-Semitism on the right, and we have anti-Semitism on the left. And this isn't political. I don't, whoever you know, you're thinking about voting for in Canada and in the United States or, or wherever else you are, the anti-Semitism of the right is a little bit more obvious, right? You're in Charlottesville, Jews will not uh, you know, replace us, they shave their head, they wear swastikas. It's pretty hard to misinterpret where they're coming from. This is, this is, we hate Jews, we hate blacks, we hate gays, we hate everybody, right? Okay, you're, you're a hater. And that's actually one of the things that makes anti-Semitism so hard to fight, because it's a faith. It actually is a faith. People talk about defeating Hamas, well, you can kill the combatants, but you can't erase the ideology. Anti-Semitism is, is, is a form of that. And the anti-Semitism on the left is a little bit more insidious and harder to find because now you have a movement that's very progressive and we can go to the his, through the history of racism in the United States and it's horrible and a lot of this debate hinges on whether or not you think that the starting date is 1776 or 1619 when slaves were first brought, 1776 was Declaration of Independence. I'll save that for an American history class. But the left now, in order to contend with other social programs that hasn't worked has adopted something called intersectionality. So intersectionality is a word that many of you have heard, most of you probably understand in depth. For those of you who don't, it's essentially saying that we are persecuted, let's band together. As the disadvantaged in society, there's strength in unity, there's strength in numbers. And the more of us there are to combat the uh, prejudice against us, the more effective we will be in eliminating that prejudice. That's great, right? And it makes sense. I mean, I'm not Latino, but I would think that it's pretty crummy to be discriminated against if you're Latino. I'm not gay, but I think it'd be pretty crummy to be discriminated against if you're gay or black. And, and, and those feelings probably feel pretty similar. But once you start deciding who merits the badge of, 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 of discrimination, then you're just as big a bigot as the people you're fighting. You know, one of the funnier stories that I've heard, and we're in a synagogue, so it's, it's like Yom Kippur, and, and um, you know, the rabbi goes to the uh, bima, and he prostrates himself and says, God, God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, I've sinned and I'm nothing before you, God, in the chazan. Goes and he does the same. Oh Lord, Hashem, please forgive me, forgive me, I'm nothing, and prostrates himself. And the Shamash goes and does the same thing and says, Oh Lord, forgive me, I'm nothing. And the cantor turns to the rabbi, I go, Look who thinks he's suddenly nothing. Right? <laughs> so, so the Jews choose, well, you don't belong here. Not only don't you belong here, but you're the oppressors. So it's worse. We're not only letting you into our club of the oppressed, but we are pointing at you as as the oppressor. 
And then, you know, all bets are off. Because then you come back to Natan Sharansky, also very famous, well, I mean, I don't need to tell you who Natan Sharansky is. He's written, several, he's written several books, but one of the things that he's written that, I, that really resonates is, is a test for anti-Semitism. And it came about when people talked anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, and for those of you who remember, it came out about 15 years ago. He identified the three Ds, okay? It's delegitimization, demonization, and double standards. All right, so delegitimization, Jews don't deserve a homeland. Why? Because they're a religion. Catholics don't have a homeland, Muslims don't have a homeland, so Jews don't deserve a homeland. All right, demonization, Jews are the other, Jews are wicked, Jews are evil, right? And, and, and this is where anti-Semitism, I mean, has been so consistently inconsistent, right? The Jews are responsible for communism, the Jews are capitalists, the Jews are, you know, sexless, weird creatures or they're, you know, lecherous perverts. Um, you know, the Jews are very materialistic or the Jews just, just focus on intellectualism. But that doesn't, that doesn't make it any easier to take pot shots at it because it's, it's a faith. It's not, it's not a discipline. And it's a very appealing faith because people feel like they need to define themselves by identifying and scapegoating another. And that's where the demonization comes in. And, and it excuses everything. Right? If you disagree with somebody, you can convince them that you're right and they're wrong. But if somebody needs to be expunged, there's no room for discussion. And double standards, coming back to, to what's going on at the ICJ and what's going on in the world, is when Israel and Jews are not only held to much higher standards, but they're held to unconscionable and unattainable standards. And that's where this, this uh, notion of ceasefire and genocide, it's maybe part of last week's discussion, but it's relevant here as well. You know, and I talked a little bit about why you, you, know, you can't call Israel colonialists because it's not like we're going from London to India and Africa and conquering other people. We have no place to go. But the, 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 the ceasefire, so they did not call for a ceasefire. That's what people, people expected that they would call for a ceasefire. And that's what those of us who looked at this pretty carefully assumed was the agenda of the South African government that brought this forward. A ceasefire just means, just take it. A ceasefire means go back to the pogroms, go back to the Cossacks, go back to the Inquisition, go back to the Crusaders, go back to the Nazis. Just take it and hopefully some of you will live to fight another day or maybe you won't. And that's the difference between having a state of Israel. And that's why Israel can't have a ceasefire. We can have a very intelligent debate, we can have a temporary ceasefire, but we can't have a ceasefire that enables Israel to return to the state of the world that existed on October 6th. And the fact that the world would want us to do that is clearly a double standard, because no other country in the world would be expected to take it, unless they weren't recognized as a country, or the delegitimization is. Or unless they were demonized because they're evil and they need to be expunged, not only from the region, but from every place else. That's where from the river to the sea is. So you got comics and late night television who are going and asking these protesters, you know which river, you know which sea, and invariably they don't. Um, that doesn't make it, I mean, again, so it, it makes those specific protesters a little bit less morally culpable because they have no idea what they're saying. They're sort of the useful idiots of the people who are agitating all of this. But it doesn't make the challenge on campus any easier. And I, uh, I've been doing a lot of public speaking and I've had a couple of sessions with a gentleman named Roy Altman. I don't know if you know him, he's a judge here in Miami. He's a judge on the federal court. He's a Trump appointee, big guy, um, born in Venezuela, moved here when he was a couple of years old. He's probably in his early 40s now. and played quarterback for Columbia. He uh, went to Yale Law School. He has a, a six-year-old, our kids play together, and this came out in one of the panels. And he goes, Lenny, what is going on with our schools? What is happening at Columbia, at Yale, at Harvard? And I said, Judge, I, I, don't, I don't have a very good answer for you. But the good news is it takes a lot of pressure off our kids, because they don't have to study so hard. We're not gonna send them to those schools. And so th thank you for laughing and clapping, but here's the dilemma for the community. Here's the dilemma for the community. What do we do? You know, obviously what Mark Rowan did at Penn, 
and Bill Ackman did at Harvard. Worked. You know, I was, I, I have some Harvard shirts and I bought some for my daughter when I went to a reunion a couple of years ago. I didn't want to, I didn't wear mine and I didn't want, to, I didn't want her to wear hers. And when the three um, presidents, I don't know what Judy Kornbluth is still doing at MIT and the fact that she's Jewish, I think makes it even worse that she's still in her job, not better. But Liz Magill wrote pretty quickly a letter of um, you know, resignation. Uh, Claudine Gay didn't actually plagiarize that letter. Her letter was worse. <laughs> and it really was. And I mean, now that this is a friendly audience, I could tell you this is an original comment, but her letter literally, and I was so offended by it, essentially said, why can I no longer be judged by the color of my skin, but rather by the content of my character? Well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that's, that's just the way it's gonna be. Pardon? Yeah, grammar error, so exactly. 38 times in 40 publications um, before word processors. Anyway, I, w without talking about her or Kornbluth or Magill, they just happened to be pulled in because for whatever reason, people thought the three high-profile female presidents of major universities would play well in Congress. And they played horribly in Congress because they couldn't get out of their own mealy-mouthed uh, semantic gymnastics that made no sense. And in retrospect, when they read their own transcripts, they realized it made no sense. And they were driven by lawyers and other advisors and handlers and spin doctors and message meisters. And that's where we live. So here's the question for those of you who are sending children or grandchildren or hot friends who are applying to, to, to universities. What do they do? I think the Israeli universities are, are, are top notch and they're gonna get not only a lot of our students, but they're also gonna get back a lot of faculty. Up until now, there was this massive, massive malaise about the brain drain and all these academics come to the United States, they do a postdoc and they never go back, except for vacation. So I think we're gonna see a lot of that actually coming back to Israel, but also now. I mean, my daughter's in the first grade, I got time to think about that. But for people who are a bit older, and she's not that smart, but just for people, to go to college now. She's smart enough to get into the second grade. We're waiting. Uh, but the, the, the point is, for those students who are thinking about it, where do you go? Right? I interview for Harvard College, and I've had one of the interviewees ask me. So I, said, I didn't say you didn't get in yet. Don't worry about it. But, but if you do, do you go? And, and I, don't, I don't have a good answer for that. I was at a, I was at a dinner. It was a couple of tables in advance of the big Hatsala uh, event that they had here in December, and, and Alan Dershowitz was there, and he's very well known, and I know him. He was a professor of mine 30 years ago, more, and we were talking about this, and I said, Alan, Professor Dershowitz, would you send your kid to Harvard? Absolutely I would. I definitely would send my kid to Harvard. He has to have the tenacity to stand up and look at those bullies in the eye and say, you cannot get away with this. This campus is not a form. Alan, 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 you're a professor emeritus. <laughs> You've been litigating, you're 85 years old, you've been litigating since you've been in diapers, right? I mentioned that, you've been, you, this is not, that's not why kids go to school. That's not why you want your children to pay 70, $80,000 for a college education. Uh, but his way of thinking is a very rational way of thinking. I don't reject it, I really don't. Because if we, lo if we lose the Harvards and we lose the MITs and we lose the Penns and the Princetons and the Cornells of the world, then those are where future leaders are gonna come from. Those are where the captains of industry and the political class are going to come from. And if we're not there, we are doing voluntarily what, you know, one of the reasons why Jews were relatively disenfranchised 100 years ago was because they weren't allowed into those schools. If we choose not to apply and not to go to those schools, those schools are not gonna disappear, but they will increasingly become laboratories for anti-Israel rhetoric, which ultimately is, is, is very closely aligned, if not identical, to anti-Semitism. This is the new anti-Semitism. And maybe a year ago, or six months ago, I would have participated in the discussion that you know there's a difference, and, and, and there were subtle differences, but this is the new anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism started out, I mean, if Abraham was the first Jew, he had issues. He's his four kings, fought five kings, and then obviously we knew what happened in Egypt. I mean, you go back to Shemot. This was, this was overt anti-Semitism against the Jews. Havani chakmalon. 
throw them into the Yol, throw them into the Nile. That was tribal anti-Semitism, right? Which over the years, certainly since Constantine became religious anti-Semitism. You look at the, we talked about the Catholic Church, you look about the Jewish experience, particularly in, in, in Europe, but also under the, the Muslims since the seventh century, that's religious anti-Semitism. About 150 years ago, obviously culminating in the Holocaust, you had what I would call racial anti-Semitism. The Jews were identified as a race and had to be eliminated as an evil demonic race. And now you have political anti-Semitism. What we're experiencing right now is political anti-Semitism. And it doesn't matter if you've never been to Israel, if you've never heard of Israel, if you don't like Israel, if you're Jewish, you're that. And we want to eliminate Israel, therefore we want to eliminate you. And you've got some very, um, you have very many left-wing Jews that I know. I don't know a lot of them. Not, I'm not on the right, I'm not on the left, but I tend not to, I, I tend not to spend too much time on the extremes because life's too short and, and I, I don't like having conversations with people that aren't productive. And when it comes to Israel, I have a lit, litmus test basically and you're welcome to borrow mine, ask the person you're talking with, which part of Israel is not, is not occupied Palestine? And if they can't answer that question, talk to them about something else. But they're very frustrated right now because they wanted to march. They want to march with Black Lives Matter. And, 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 and they could be dark-skinned and they could be lesbian, they could be gay, but if they're Jewish, not Israeli, you can't march with us. And it's mind-blowing but it's happening. And this is where I think the whole human rights movement has been, it's a delicate term to use right now, but has been held hostage by the radical left. And I'm worried about both. I'm worried about both the right and the left, and I'm not gonna say which I'm worried more about. What I'm worried the most about is when the two of them get together. When the one thing that the two extremes can agree upon is that, is that, is that the Jews are evil, Terrible things happen in our history. And when I look at the seminal documents of, of, of human rights law in, in, the 19, in sorry, the 20th century, the 1940s after the Holocaust, there were so many Jewish luminaries who participated in that process. They weren't all Jews. I mean, Eleanor Roosevelt was one of the progenitors of the United Nations, but so was Rene Cassin. So was um, Hirsch V. Lauderpacht, I mean, who also, uh, you know, wrote the declarations, the Universal Declarations of the Rights of Man, and and their students, uh, Morris Abrams in the United States, uh, Bob Burns in the United States, who started Human Rights uh, Human Rights Watch, which then was itself taken hostage by people like 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 Richard Falk and Kenneth Roth, both Jews who don't identify as Jews, but who built massive budgets just to demonize Israel for decades. And, and, it, and we have little small institutions. We, we have the Raoul Wallenberg Center, you know, the UN Watch, Hill and Neuer, another fellow from Montreal. Raoul Wallenberg Center, um, founded by Professor Erwin Kotler from Montreal, many of you know. Erwin actually is a personal friend. And he, and I talked about this after what happened, and we talked about what's going on in the schools. And he has two friends, uh, tragically passed away last year, very, very close in time to each other, but they were very close and they had resources and they wanted to, to honor him and endow an Erwin Kotler Human Rights Chair at McGill Law School where he taught for many years before he went into government. And, and he said no. He said, I don't, I don't want that chair. And it's not because he lacks ego. I mean, I'm not saying he's more or less than most of the rest of us. But he was afraid. He says, look, I'm, I'm close to 80 years old right now. Now he's gonna be 84, but I'm close to 80 years old right now. And, and, and in, in 20 years, if not in 10 years, that chair is gonna be filled by somebody who's teaching BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions, right? And I don't want my name and my legacy and what I've poured my heart and soul and my professional life into establishing to be commandeered by people who have completely different views and, and priorities than I do. And, and I don't know how we get it back. I don't know how we claim it, it, it'll take a lot of money. If I look at Amnesty International, HRW, their collective budget annually is close to half a billion dollars. Amnesty International has offices in 70 countries and 2,500 people working for them. So I don't know if this is a priority for the big philanthropists. I think the ones I know are sort of more focused on the schools. 
And there the question is, do the Bill Ackmans work within the system within Harvard? Do the, do the Michael Bloomberg's work within the system at John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins? Or Rowan at, at Mark Rowan? Mark Rowan's actually gonna be here on February 6th. Um, at, at, at Penn, or do they find another school? Do they go to the University of Florida where Ben Sass is the president and say, you know what? I gave those guys $100 million, but I still have another $100 million to give you. Let's build a strong research institution. Let's attract effective faculty. They're not gonna necessarily be Israeli professors who feel uncomfortable on their campuses, but they, there will be. It'll be the next generation of Urban Kotlers. It'll be the next generation of Alan Dershowitz's. It'll be the next generation of scientists who want to build a, 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 a laboratory, build an academic platform in a place where they will enjoy coming to teach and their children will enjoy coming to learn. So I don't know what the answer is to that. I mean, we could do both. I mean, there's enough, thank God, uh, for as long as let us keep our resources, we have, we have, a, lot of, um, we have a lot of resources that we can, we can advocate with. And, and, and it makes a difference. The, the, the way things played out at Penn and Harvard would not have played out the same way if the donors did not push back. So yes, there's gonna be some backlash, and certainly one of the reasons that I spoke uncharacteristically freely about Claudine Gay is because her resignation letter was a dog whistle against the people who she feels outed her for her plagiarism because she thought she could get away with being mealy-mouthed, but she can't get away with breaching multiple times the very code of ethics that any student at Harvard would be expelled for violating, right? At that point, you know, you can hold your nose so much, but when you break all your fingers holding it, you gotta find, you know, you gotta find another hand. So, um, so that to me, so I'm worried about what to do there, and I'm also worried about the fact that we need to be having these conversations. I never thought about this stuff before, honestly, before October 7th. I never thought that the situation on college campuses would degrade to such a point that people like most of us in the room who value higher education, who have children, grandchildren, who are able to get into schools that didn't allow Jews or had very, very restrictive quotas for a very long time, would choose not to go because it would be a very unpleasant place to learn. And this is, coming now full circle to the title of the talk. Why should non-Jews care? And I'm speaking to an audience full of Jews. Anti-Semitism is not a Jewish problem. Anti-Semitism is a global problem, it's a societal problem, it's a democracy problem, and it's a national security interest in the United States, it's a national security interest in Canada, it's a national security interest sort of more so than in Israel, right? Israel has its own national security challenges. But anti-Semitism here is a very serious problem. And I'm coming back to the, you know, the broken windows uh, approach. There is a, a famous priest, his name was Martin Niemöller. I don't know if you ever heard of him. But he, um, he was a German, he was born in the 20s, and at first he was actually friendly. No, I think he was born earlier than that. He died, well, no. He, Anyway, he was a priest, a young priest, probably born um, at the beginning of the, of the um, 20th century. And he, um, he was initially friendly with the Nazis when they were coming to power. And then he didn't like the way they were treating the church, so he, he fought the Nazis and he was imprisoned. He survived, but he wrote a poem that he's best known for, saying when they came from the communists, I didn't speak out because I'm not a communist. When they came from the socialists, I didn't speak out because I'm not a socialist. So on and so forth, they came from the Jews, I did not speak out because I was not Jewish, and then they came for me, and there was nobody left to speak. And that's, that was certainly true then with tragic consequences, and it's just as true now. There were some, there were very many righteous Gentiles during the war, and we're commemorating Holocaust um, Remembrance Day tomorrow. Interestingly enough, and you need to think about it twice for it to become intuitive, there's nearly a direct correlation between the numbers of Jews who were killed in any of the constituent countries and the numbers of righteous Gentiles from those countries. So the highest number of righteous Gentiles, Poland. Next, Ukraine. Next, Lithuania. Next, Slovakia. Next, Hungary. Next, Holland. Next, and these, these, these are all countries whose Jewish populations were decimated. There weren't enough righteous Gentiles, but because there were so many Jews, there were enough instances for the Gentiles to 
to step up. Uh, again, counterintuitively, one of the one of the countries, one of the Jewish populations with the highest survival rates in Europe was Germany, because they had all the early warning signals. You know, they left before the concentration camps, like the frog in the pot, right? They knew that this is boiling water, we're out of here. Some of them tragically went to Poland and Slovakia and some of the other countries that I mentioned, but but a lot of them were able to um, to survive. They just had a, I think yesterday, the day before, President Herzog had a had a ceremony in, 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 in Israel with the survivors of the kinder transport, the little kids who were, who were saved. So that was 85 years ago, right? That was, yeah, that was 1938. Um, so we are, you know, again, Godwin's theory says that once you inject the Holocaust into an argument, you've lost your argument. We're not in a Holocaust. But we are in a more serious state of affairs than, than I, certainly in my lifetime. And you know, I spent some time in the investment business. And on December 9th, 2008, Madoff stole $20 billion. He did it. He was stealing it for 30, 40 years. It just on that day, they discovered it. So it's not that the world became anti-Semitic on October 7th. It's been that way. It just, as I mentioned in the last class, the three big surprises were for me after October 7th were the depth and breadth of anti-Semitism, the organization, the coordination, and how well financed the people who hate us are, and the fact that 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 all this would be catalyzed by the murder of 1,200 people and taking hostage of 240 and all that carnage. So that's you know that's sort of like the day that, that Madoff's pyramid scheme was was exposed. But it had been going on for 30, 40 years. It's been going on for a very long time, and we're gonna speak out about it because we have to, we have to speak out about it first. But it's gonna feel very lonely, and it's hard. And as I told, uh, at least one of you was a class I gave to high school students a couple of months ago, reach out to people that you know on college campuses. Maybe now I'd even say high schools as well. I didn't realize how bad it was at the high schools. But tell them they're not alone, because it's extremely lonely to be Jewish. Uh, even when I grew up, Sometimes you didn't really want to wear a Magen David, and uh, and it wasn't necessarily because you thought someone beat you up, but maybe the you know the Greek girl or the Italian girl wouldn't, wouldn't like you as much. Certainly, her father wouldn't, but he probably wouldn't like you anyway. So, um, but now it's 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 pretty crazy. I do a lot of work with APAC, and one of the platforms at APAC that I belong to is called the New Leadership Network, and that means you're assigned a congressional representative, and you're that person's key contact. So you give them, you write them a check, you do a fundraiser for them. It's all extremely well organized and, 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 and it works. Not everybody, not every member of Congress wants a key contact. But I work with a, with a Democratic uh, congressional representative just south of Raleigh, North Carolina. And I was in Raleigh this week. I was in Raleigh Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And he said, Lenny, come to our, um, we're having a town hall on Tuesday morning. And then we're going to have a, uh, a round table, a smaller, more intimate round table with members of the community with dealing with anti-Semitism. And he's a great guy. You know, I've met his wife, I've met his kids, about the same age as my daughter and the kids have played together. They were here for the holiday at a fundraiser for him in October in, in Florida and he came down. So we, we have a very good relationship. So I said, look, I'll come a bit late to the town hall. He says, don't worry, it's running an hour and a half. I came after about 45 minutes. I see all these police outside the town hall. And I come and he's a big guy, he's like 6'2", at least 200 some pounds. And he's being escorted out by the police. And people are yelling and screaming and yelling and screaming. These were, these were anti-Israel demonstrators that shot down, shouted down his, 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 uh, his town hall. And we couldn't do the round table there um, anymore. I was the only person I think who was invited to both, but then other people started coming and they go, where's the congressman? So they had to take him back to his district office, which is about a mile and a half or two and a half kilometers away. And so we went over there, and there were about half a dozen people, you know, the head of the Federation, the JCRC, uh, a couple of rabbis from Durham and Raleigh. And I was, I was amazed at how challenging things are in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's a pretty big city. It's Research Triangle Park. You've got major universities going on there. And then I realized maybe that's the problem. And when a member of the U.S. Congress can't complete a town hall meeting, when he needs to be sort of swirled away by the police to his district office, when that chilling effect, when that intimidation takes place across the United States, it's going to have an impact. 
And for him to then sit in the more comforting confines of his own office with a couple of people who are going to tell him, thank you, first and foremost. Thank you for your support. Thank you for the administration's support. Um, but the whole agenda changed. The whole agenda changed because, yes, maybe we wanted to lobby a little bit, but that's not the forum for lobbying for the $14.3 billion. That was more of a forum to hear him out and to talk about ideas. We still did. We still tried to identify where you can have common ground. Maybe if you're dealing with your interlocutors who are very aggressive, try to find 10 points and pick six or seven that you can agree on. And I think that's possible. But the other three or four are so emotionally fraught right now that you can't have the conversation. So we actually left pretty, um, pretty upset. But I think the general consensus was, and I actually spoke as much to him as I did to his staffers. None of his staffers are Jewish. They were obviously traumatized by what happened there. They didn't expect it. They didn't see it before. And they have these town hall meetings once a month. So I don't know whether the people were on vacation or didn't feel as emboldened in October, November, or December, but at this town hall, they certainly felt emboldened enough. The thing ended, it wasn't like suspended until they were escorted out. You've seen that, the president made some remarks and people were escorted at, at, at a rally. Here, they ended it. They were, they were there in large enough numbers, there were 50 out of maybe 100 participants, half the participants, were there and they succeeded. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to intimidate, they wanted to end, there was no talking to them, it wasn't, a, and he tried, it wasn't in front of the cameras, he tried to be, look, I'm, 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 I represent all my constituents, tell me what's on your mind, maybe I can help. But they didn't want to be helped. They didn't even want to be heard. They wanted to disrupt. And that's the biggest challenge about anti-Israel, anti-Semitism, it's not so much that anybody wants their own state, it's just they don't want us to have ours. And that's what I said at the beginning. So, you know, anti-Semitism doesn't exist because of Israel. Israel exists, Israel needs to exist because of anti-Semitism. And that, I think that says it all. So yes, have I been exempt from Jewish history because I was born, um, you know, 16 years after the establishment of the modern state, to some extent, but I think Jewish history has come back and it's catching up with all of us. Uh, you know, the older you are, maybe the less of the new reality you're gonna have to deal with, but our kids and our grandchildren are, are, are not gonna be as fortunate. And, you know, this year, probably more so than any other year since 2005, International Holocaust Remembrance Day should, it won't be, except maybe by Jewish people who are aware of it, but should be commemorated as, as a rallying cry. And we say never again, and it almost sounds like a catechism, but if we're gonna think about never again, then we just have to have the guts to stand up and speak out. And it's very uncomfortable. And hopefully it doesn't involve any risk to your physical safety, but it's certainly gonna take people out of their comfort zones. It's taken me out of my comfort zone. And we were all taken out of our comfort zone in Raleigh on Tuesday morning. Uh, and it, but if, if, if I'm invited to another town hall meeting, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna ask some of you to come with me because people need to see that. You know, we live in a bubble here in Aventura. Those of you visiting from Montreal, from Toronto, I sort of know what's going on there. You know, both my elementary school and high school were, were shot at in the middle of the night. I don't know how to interpret. They don't know who did it. They don't know, you know, what the circuit was. not an accident. I mean, obviously it was targeted. Uh, Toronto is, is, is a mess. I mean, Toronto, uh, I feel from what I read, I haven't been to Toronto since October 7th, but, and there's some places like Caracas and other parts of Latin America where you really don't have um, a very, uh, you know, short or intermediate term prospect of vibrant Jewish life. But in places like Montreal, Toronto, Raleigh, North Carolina, the, the, the community should be, should be going through this. We do have friends, we do have allies. And when I say that it's a national security issue, and when I remind us of Pastor Niemöller and, 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 and his famous poem, there are other people who are speaking on our behalf. Uh, they're few, but they're precious, and we should thank them. Um, if they're in Congress, we should thank them uh, politically. If they're you know, in, in, in the business world, non-Jews, uh, members of other ethnic communities who are going to Israel, supporting Israel. We should thank them anyway we know how. We should be buying their products. We should be shopping in their stores. We should be doing whatever we can 
to participate in something that is much more urgent than it's, than, than it's ever been, uh, certainly since the Holocaust. So see, see yourselves blessed to be living in a world where we can still make a difference and living in a world where, where there is an Israel. And I, you know, I'm not saying that everybody should should move and make Aliyah and and, and go there. I mean, I think interestingly enough, uh, if if somebody had a, you know, a lot of liquid cash, then on October 8th, you should have bought a lot of Israeli real estate because people wanted to sell. They woke up and they realized this this country is is ground zero. But then on October 9th they were reminded that this is the most valuable piece of real estate in the world. So, so we're lucky to have it. And, uh, you know, again, as, as you read B'Shalach tomorrow in synagogue and witness the miracle of the, uh, of the parting of the Red Sea, read carefully the song that Miriam sings with her tambourines at the end of the Parsha. Uh, if you can read it in Hebrew, it's, it's beautiful poetry. The English translation, I'm sure, is, is pretty faithful to it. Uh, whether whether real, written, you know, by Moses on Mount Sinai, or just by Miriam and her and her friends at the other end of the sea, it's uh, it's a reminder that we still have things to be very very grateful for. Maybe when times seem bleakest, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and on that, I will wish you all a Shabbat Shalom. I have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. The question is, should we not use anti-Semitism or more college Jew hatred? It's a good question. I mean, I'm not here giving people permission to uh, choose whatever terminology they want, but I, I, I certainly feel comfortable with calling it Jew hatred. That's, that, that's certainly what it is. Yes? There's about four to five million James in the world, in Indian religion. It's been around for thousands of years. James are known as being fairly uh, wealthy, but you never hear about anti James. What's the difference? So the E and the W and the A and the M? <laughs> Sorry, no, I'm kidding. So I'll tell you what I think the difference is. The difference probably is, and it's a good question, I'm not trying to be cynical, but the, dif the difference probably is that the Janes have probably lived amongst themselves for most of the period of time that they've been around. The, the Jains were not expelled from their little enclave in Southeast Asia, and they were allowed to flourish and use their tribal connections and family connections to help one another without uh, getting anybody's nose out of joint. And I don't know of any other religions that came out of Jainism, but certainly at least Christianity and Islam, Islam didn't come out of Judaism, but, but, but Judaism was the other and they both use Judaism as a means to demonstrate the superiority of their own religion and therefore the superiority of their own selves relative to those who practice that other religion who therefore needed to be persecuted for what it's worth. Yes? How do you explain black anti-Semitism? So it's a great question. Um, look, and I don't mean this with cynicism, but the, you know, it's not like the question is how do I explain black anti-Semitism? And it's not just because Jews have their own prejudices. And there are many people in this room, if they really look close in, in, in their own hearts, are not colorblind, right? And they do have, we do have our own pre-existing notions of how black people behave and families or lack of families. In the black community, and we tried our level best to march with Dr. King, and, and, and there are rabbis and community leaders. I mentioned Morris um, Abrams from the, the head of the HAC. And a, and a civil rights lawyer, but and, and, and Rabbi Heschel famously, but at the same time there were also Jewish landlords collecting rents from impoverished and, and, and um, you know, black tenants, and there were Jewish employers who were uh, perhaps underpaying or relative to their expectations black employees. It did feel within the broader American community that even though the Jews came, came here later, they came here voluntarily, and even though they're fewer in number, they succeeded much more economically, and I think that there's a lot of resentment, and I think that based on the populism, and certainly in the churches, and in some of the communities, it was very easy for some agitated leaders 
to, uh, to get some of their congregants frenzied up about hating the Jews. I don't see it very different from, you know, the neo-Nazi hatred of, 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 of uh, Jews and the fact that Black Lives Matter uh, and Black Lives Matter, they do. So do Jewish Lives Matter. If you tell that to an, to an adherent to Black Lives Matter, they'll call you a racist. So, so not only are many blacks, not all blacks. I mean, I, I wouldn't even say most blacks. If, if, you, uh, um, if you feel like writing a check, you're welcome to come to Moe's on Monday morning. We have Richie Torres. Richie Torres is a congressman from, from the Bronx. He's black, he's gay, he's a Democrat. I've been doing this for a long time. I don't speak as articulately and passionately about Israel as he does. You couldn't, you couldn't invent anything better than Richie Torres. But he's not representative, unfortunately, not even of his own constituencies, okay. constituents, let alone blacks across the board. There are many organizations, I mentioned the HAC, the ADL, this congregation, other federations, outreach to black pastors, outreach to Latino leaders. We're making a dent, but it's a small dent. There's a lot more work that we need to do but you need two to tango. And I think unfortunately, because of what's going on and the intersectionality, you are seeing a lot, a lot of African-American participation at some of these very scary anti-Israel anti -Israel, um, demonstrations. Yes, you had a question. So a friend asked me uh, to ask you this question. <laughs> How come anti-Semitism is all over the world, everywhere, so many of them, and we are such a small group of people, 42% of the population of the world. And this uh, new answer, it's not that uh, we are causing this anti-Semitism, but that because of anti-Semitism, we are such a small part of the world. So it's a great question. I'm going to repeat it. Um, so we're 0.2% of the world population. If you do the math, there are about 15 million Jews, and there's slightly over 8 billion people, so we're actually slightly under 0.2% of the global population. And our numbers are getting smaller, even though the numbers in Israel are getting bigger. There were 18 million Jews before the Holocaust, so one-third of all Jewry and two-thirds of all European Jewry were, were murdered by the Nazis. That was uh, certainly in absolute numbers the largest um, massacre, murder of Jews in, in history. In terms of relative numbers, you know, it's harder to judge because you go back to ancient history, the, the siege of Jerusalem, uh, the expulsions from Rome, look, the 10 tribes were, if I'm, not all tribes had the same amount of people, but you had 83% of the Jews, if, if you go per tribe, wiped out in 722 um, before the Common Era. But what you're, what you're pointing out, and what I've thought about a lot, is that even with the pogroms and the Cossacks and the Inquisition and the Holocaust, most of the reduction in our numbers or the, the, the gap between where we are and where we could have been is voluntary attrition. And it's times like this. It's times like this where it's just too hard to be Jewish, right? It's, I, I want, I can't find a different planet to live on, so I want to live on this planet in, in a different religion. And I don't want my kids to have to go through that. And, and maybe within a generation or two, same way people come to America from Guatemala where they may have been a taxi driver or whatever it is. Here, they're, they're, they're cleaning floors. So it's not as good as what they were doing there. They may have even been a doctor and now they're doing something more menial, but their kids are gonna be able to go to school and their grandchildren are gonna be able to go to college. And there are a lot of Jews who just looked at the world and it certainly happened in Europe a couple hundred years ago during the Enlightenment where you had this emancipation. And, and, and that is one of the many reasons why our numbers are so small. And I understand that. I certainly can't judge anybody, let alone people who lived hundreds of years before I was born. But the part of the question that maybe you did answer is, I do believe at a very high price that the fact that we have been subject to so much discrimination, so much hatred for so many years has made us stronger. You know, what doesn't kill you make you stronger. I hate that expression. But it's kind of true. Because the fact that you've been able to survive having dealt with so many virulent strains and viruses and infections, I mean, the societal infections, have made us stronger. You know, and, and, and uh, we've never been as strong as we are now. And frankly, again, not to get theological, but Israel was a mess before October 7th. 
for those of us who born there, lived there, spent time there, there has never been such a deep societal schism within Israel since 1948 until 2023. And October 7th changed that. I hope it changes it for a long period of time. I don't know. You know, people say, um, together we will win or we're together until, until victory, however you define that. But it's an excellent question. But I want you to see both sides. So there is the voluntary attrition. There is the fact that, you know, we didn't live with the Jains. We lived with the Christians and the Muslims and the Macedonians and the Seleucids and the Romans. But, um, but we're still here. And I think one of the reasons that we've been able to preserve relatively consistent Judaism, whether you index it to Torah or anything else, is because we've had a lot of help from the people who hate us, counterintuitively, but it's, it's a fact. Um, yes, thank you. The, re the reality is they hate us because in their hearts they make them feel inferior. And the reason that in all societies we've risen to the top regardless of what they've done to us. And then the last remaining bastion of why they hate Israel so much is the so-called manly arts, agriculture, military, athletics. So now Israel has been the leader in agricultural um, innovation. The recognized as the best soldiers, and even now athletes are being banned. Israeli athletes are being banned because they can't compete. Yeah. And that's in their hearts. They, they, we can't say this, but in their hearts they feel inferior because by any objective measurement, our culture has been superior in all in all environments. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm not going to. Yeah, so I'm not going to say yes or no. Yes. Yeah, so look, not all Jews are successful, and not all Gentiles are unsuccessful. The Israeli military is something we can all be proud of, but we proved is is quite vulnerable. And I think now we're seeing that it's more vulnerable than a lot of us expected. Uh, as far as you know, agriculture. Yes, Israel has tremendous agricultural. Ex experience and necessities of mother invention and we got a challenging piece of land that, that, that has flourished but there are other countries that have developed equally innovative uh, agriculture I, I don't I don't know that I would say it's just because we're superior and they're inferior I think I think that's a that's so a danger yeah well I, certainly some do and, and and jealous and if Jews are perceived to live in nice houses and drive fancy cars. Some Jews do and some Jews don't, but obviously the ones who do are gonna be easier to identify and target. Um, I'm gonna take the three, these four questions and then, then I, like in a row, like together, yes. A member of our school recently uh, went to parliament we're from Ottawa uh, to try to solicit support for Israel from his member of parliament. So he paid him a visit. The end of the visit was the member of parliament said the Palestinians have been uh, persecuted for the last 75 years. How can I support Israel? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't live in that writing, but you know, he, he's not the only one. And the fact is, you know, maybe in a, in, so the, the, the anecdote is a member of parliament in Ottawa uh, took an audience with, uh, I guess, a Jewish constituent, but upon hearing uh, the pitch, basically said, you know, Palestinians have been persecuted for 75 years, how can I support Israel? So that, I mean, that could happen in the US Congress, but with very, very few members. My fear is that at some point, those members won't even be taking a meeting. So uh, I'm, I'm not surprised to hear that. Yes. I read an article that uh, the Harvard Corporation Board of Trustees is looking at Barack Obama as their next president. And what are your thoughts about I, I read the same thing. Um, I don't know. If it happens, it happens. Uh, but um, we, we do get, anybody who's, who's an alum does get to vote for the Harvard, for the Board of Trustees, but we don't get to vote to select for the Harvard Corporation. They're the ones who make the decision. So, you know, we'll watch it like everybody else. I, I, I don't even think he'd want the job because he's kind of enjoying life without accountability. Yes. Views, 
Where is this? What? Jewish leadership, the Jewish organization, fighting for the cause of the oh, race, all this year. So the question is, uh, I guess there are two questions. One is, do I think the Jewish community has been effective in combating anti-Semitism on campus? And is the Biden administration forceful enough in participating in combating anti-Semitism? So I think the Jewish organizations did whatever they could. I, I mean, I, I'm gonna point fingers at all of you. Just look back at your financial statements and see how much money you've contributed to Jewish organizations that you expect to be fighting that battle on campus. Right, it's a question of resources. So if you haven't written a check to the AJC, if you haven't written a check to Hillel, if you haven't written a check to you know, the local chapters at the various universities, and ask yourself what else you're doing with your money. Um, I'm not just directing this at you, I'm directing this to a community. As far as the Biden administration, there are limits on what you can expect from an administration, especially in an election year. I think I'm, I'm actually pleasantly surprised with the resilience that this administration is showing in light of who its constituents are. It's much harder for a Democratic president in an election year with the voter turnout being probably the key determinant of the outcome of what's gonna happen in November to alienate such a broad swath of his constituency by not being even more forceful against Israel and basically not following what I'll call the Tom Friedman playbook and imposing their will. Now there are, you know, obviously, if, I know many people in the room, if we were president, we do things differently, but if we were president, is, is a fantasy. Uh, the real president, and more importantly, the people who are, I don't mean this with any disrespect, but really making the decisions, are concerned about losing an election in November to somebody that they really don't like, and somebody that many people are afraid of. I'm not telling you I'm afraid of him, or you should be afraid of him, but, but they are. And I think that if, if, if the president looks at his biggest credential after 50 plus years in politics, from his perspective, it's the fact that he prevented a second Trump term. And I think it's pretty clear to people that if, if he were even more supportive of Israel than he's, than he's already been, he would pay a very heavy political price. Yes, last two questions. Yeah, go for it. When you say nationalistic, you mean here in the United States, or? Not sure I understand that. Oh, in other words, are we better off living in a globalized world or, a, or, a, or an insular world from, from anti-Semitism? Like, in other words, if I'm afraid of anti-Semitism, should I welcome globalization? Yeah. I think so. I think that I think that any time societies become insular and uh, anti-otherness, they're going to look next door before they look outside their own country. So of course they're going to be nationalistic because they want to prevent the Syrians and the Brownies and the South Asians and the Chinese from moving in and and and, and wrecking our society. But they're going to be they're going to be equally. Uh, Well, intersectionality is anti-Semitism. It's become anti-Semitism. And I think intersectionality doesn't look at things globally. I think intersectionality is a very parochial, very insular way of looking at society here within the United States. It's not nearly enough about being participants on a global stage. And I, uh, I think that having a more cosmopolitan perspective and seeing ourselves in a community of nations, but really a community of nations, not just not just trying to, you know, we're not gonna go live on another planet, but if, we, if we're able to interact effectively with other players internationally, uh, I, think, I think we're better off as a country, and I think that the constituent minorities are gonna fare better within the United States. I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of, of, uh, of extreme isolationism. Yes? Don't you think it's time that the line is drawn 
congressman should be allowed to have a round table and should have to run out of that meeting. And what he should do instead is have another meeting, all right? And when people break the law, right, they should be held accountable. I agree. They should be the ones that are taking on the world. So they were. It's, I agree with you. So the answer, the answer is yes, and I was there. Well, no, no. He, he could have not left the room. So the, the question is, and with this will close. The question was, and I shared the anecdote with um, with with uh, Congressman Nickel on Tuesday morning, that hasn't the line been crossed? Shouldn't that have been a red line? That here we are in the United States of America. There are 435 members of Congress. When a congressman is convening a town hall in his own district and there's a disruption, he should not have to leave his own town hall, the disruptors should all be arrested. Right? That's the point. That's, I certainly don't disagree with that. I certainly don't disagree with that. So, and then there's a the practical reality. So I was there, and the police response was pathetic. There were, there were three officers, there weren't enough officers, there weren't enough officers to stand up to the demonstrators. You would have had, you know, a Kent State Right? You would have had a Kent State type situation possibly if you would have allowed these 50 rabble rousers to pounce these three armed officers. It was much easier for them to form a little human shield around the congressman and escort him out into a, a car and take him to his district office. Next time, will there be more police protection? Look, they're not allowed to demonstrate in a town hall without a permit. So yes, we have freedom of assembly, it's part of the First Amendment, but you need a permit to demonstrate in a public place, and a town hall is a public place. So yes, viscerally, I agree with you now. Will the city of Garner, which is the suburb south of Raleigh, will the city of Garner Police Department make a different decision? Will the Wake County Police Department make a different decision the next time Congress Nickel or, 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 or Congress Jackson, Congressman Jackson or um, Congresswoman Kathy Manning or any of the people in that part of North Carolina have town hall? I'm sure they're aware of it, but, but for better or for worse, it didn't really make the news. I was curious whether or not it would make the news. I was still in Raleigh the next morning. I picked up a paper. It didn't make the news. I was at a meeting that evening with some pretty, uh, I was at dinner with some pretty, you know, political heavyweights, including the Speaker of the House in North Carolina. Um, so he didn't know about it. He's a Republican. But, um, but he, he, didn't, he didn't even know that that happened. I'm not saying he should have, but this fellow was a colleague of his. He was in the Senate before he went to Congress, and this guy's running for Congress now. But now, if this turned into what you think it should have, it would have made the national news. And and hold on, good. Let those people see that they're gonna be held accountable. It made the national news, maybe one of them was butt in the head, maybe one of them was shot. But unfortunately, unfortunately, that would also be a catalyst for many pretenders to try to do comparable things in other places around the country. It's a difficult, it's a difficult issue. And all of this is a difficult issue. I don't have any, real good answers, but I know that doing nothing is not an answer. I know that being complicit is not an answer. I know that being silent is not an answer. So uh, for those of you who have gotten to know me a little bit over the past 10, 12, 13 years, I, I've always done my level best to be optimistic and I believed in it. I really did think that uh, you don't need to look at the world through rose colored glasses to feel like we're lucky. We're lucky to be living in the world that we live. We're lucky to be raising you know, children, grandchildren. Um, living in America, Canada, Israel, these are, these are three blessed countries and I wear the flag, you know, the flags of each on a pin with pride. But it feels different, it really does. This, this, this has been, this has been a, a big change for all of us and you know, thank you for taking the time out of your day to come and share some thoughts and listen to mine. We'll see you next week when we're gonna be talking about other things. <laughs>